we know what elegance is. You know, elegance, if you're going to get up in the morning, a simple alarm clock is typically going to be a lot more effective than a Rube Goldberg contraption. Um, what we want to talk about today is um, why we're so interested in complexity and elegance. How does, it, how does complexity contribute to the cost of your systems and, and what we can do about it? So in order to get into that, we have to talk about you know, what is complexity, where does it come from, why, why, do you ha why do you currently have it, and kind of how to get rid of it. And we've got some examples um, of places we've been where we can get to much simpler systems than we've had in the past. So um, there's two things, I think, going on with information systems that contribute to complexity. One of them is scale. As things scale up, they typically get more complex. But that's not the only thing. In fact, the, the, the tricky bit is as things scale up and as they interact, that's where the real complexity comes from. And we're going to kind of go through uh, area by area which things seem to be more subject to this kind of com interaction complexity and which things you know, scale just fine. We've been, we've been studying this for probably a decade now, and in some cases, some of what I'm going to say has come from just estimating information systems. You know, how, how is it that this accounts receivable system costs 100 times more than, this, than another one? You know, they both look like accounts receivable systems. They have a lot of the same functions, but there's something different, either in this organization or these particulars, that make one way more complex, far larger, et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of what we're going to uh, unravel here a little bit. So as things scale up, you know, in, in traditional economics, if something, if the cost goes up proportionate to something scaling up, we say it's, it's, it scales linearly. Right? So if twice as much of the input, you know, twice as much output for twice as much input. In, in the real world, a lot of people believe that scale has an, that, that there is an economy of scale. And when you manufacture things, most people would tell you, you know, every time you double the, the number of things you manufacture, the, the cost per item comes down some predictable small percentage. But some things have a diseconomy of scale. As you double the number of them, the cost per unit goes up instead of going down. And that's what we want to explore here. Why, why does that plague some of the things that we do in information systems and not everything? And how does that, how does that translate? <clears throat> so here's the seven or eight things I'm going to talk about and, and how each is affected by uh, scale and complexity. And we've been hearing a lot about big data. And one of the questions, is big data per se complex? And actually, in most cases, at least most of the ones I've looked at, it's just the opposite. Big data is, is typically a very simple, you know, uh, whether it's sensor data or whatever it is, the data itself is pretty simple, and it, and it scales up easily. You know, you can get that. That's what big is. So we're going to kind of go through a thought uh, process here. Just kind of think to yourself whether these parts of an uh, information system scale linearly, or they have economy of scale or diseconomy of scale. So for instance, and, and how to think about this, if you had a database with a million records in it, is it you know, a thousand times more expensive to run and operate and keep going than one with only a thousand records in it? And I think most people would say, no, that actually data in a database by itself probably has economy of scale. Once you've once you've built the system and the database, you can put more and more data in. And yes, we get some uh, issues as we scale up, but but for the most part, that's you know that's what a system is. You can put more and more things in it, and it scales up. How about schemas? You think schemas have economy of scale or diseconomy of scale? My my sense is, my experience is that you know the more complex, you get a schema, every time you go to add another attribute or another column or another table, it's, it's more expensive than the last one. 
So, you know, if each new unit is more expensive than the last one, you've got discounting of scale. If each new unit is cheaper than the last one, you have economy of scale. So if you have, how about lines of code? You have programs with lots of lines of code. You go to add another line of code. Typically, each line, the, the bigger the system, every line tends to get more and more expensive. This is why big systems are complex and they cost a lot. Um, if you have a lot of content in your site, you go to add more content, does the, the next piece of content cost you more than the last one? No, I don't think so. I think content's probably one of those things that it doesn't have a lot, of, a lot of interaction with the other content. There are links, there are things going on, but for the most part, it feels like content is sort of linear. How about having lots of users come to your site? Does the, does the incrementally next user cost you more or less to add than the previous user. Does that one have an answer? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, for the, I mean, people like Facebook have proven that that uh, you can scale up the number of users pretty rapidly and pretty easily without a lot of, of incremental cost. And certainly, the 800 millionth user is not disproportionately more expensive to bring on than the, the first few. Whereas with code or schema, the eight, 800 millionth line of code it's probably the most expensive line of code you got there, or the eight millionth element in your schema. You know, if an application has, if you add another user interface to your application, is that getting more, you know, incrementally more expensive or less expensive? And I'd say more. I mean, typically, every time you add another user interface, there's more procedures, there's more training, there's more interaction. It has to deal with all the other ones that came before it. And the pattern here is, is pretty much that. If the next thing you add has to deal with all the things that came before it, then these things tend to have diseconomy. And if they kind of stand alone, you just add them, they have economy. Uh, interfaces, you know, if you've built complex systems that have lots of machine, you know, application to application interfaces, I think you'd agree that you add another one of them and it gets more complex. Each interface has a tendency to, to have to deal in some way with every interface that went before it. And then finally processes, for the most part they seem to be mostly linear. I, I've seen some really weird extreme cases. I was reading a trade magazine recently and somebody was talking about business process, you know, one of these tools or something and how it saved them. And it happened to say, um, prior to implementing this tool we had uh, 400,000 steps in our, in, our, in our processes and 600,000 customers. And I thought, God, what kind of, you know, there's no economy of scale at all there. If every single customer gets his own process, I don't know what, I don't know what they were doing. It's it, good customer service, I suppose, but um, a little bit weird. But, but for most people, you know, you add more processes and it, it sort of probably scales linearly. So why... Am I even got kind of going through that? Because um, every part of your information system isn't created equal and doesn't contribute the same amount to the complexity of the whole. And when, when we start to understand that, we'll start to see, oh, that's, that's why this is so expensive. That's why this is so hard. So um, what we're trying to do with, uh, with this whole complexity conversation is say, if you allow complexity to creep into your system, costs go up, flexibility goes down. I mean, we've seen that every place you've been. It may not be exactly obvious what's contributing to that, but that seems to be certainly true. <clears throat> now, some of the complexity and some of the scale is what I would call good complexity. You know, most people want to have more data, big data, and want to have more users, and want to have more processes. So, you know, we're not trying to completely discourage scale or adding things on or anything like that. But some of the some of the things we just talk about increase complexity and cost, decrease flexibility, disproportionate to what they add. You know, having lots more schema doesn't necessarily by itself make you a better business. It, but it does make you a more complex and more expensive business. Same with more code. Having more code in all your systems doesn't actually 
get you anything. The same way that having more users does, typically, or even having more data does, typically, but having more interfaces, more ap application integration points, et cetera, et cetera, isn't by itself what you want. That's just what you have to put up with. So if we look at that and say, how do each of those contribute to the complexity and cost of the whole, it looks pretty much like this. We, I've, I've kind of arrayed these seven or eight, nine things here. Adding more users typically contributes to, you know, you, you know, often have more content, whether it was user-generated content or some of your own content, just to have more users and the act of having more users. That tends to contribute that way. Also having more data, that's where content comes from in a lot of cases. There's, there's a slight relationship here that the more data you have, you tend to, to start finding variations in the data and therefore deciding, oh, I should have more schema. I should have more schema that represents the variation in the data that I have. Um, typically, if you have more users, more kinds of users, you will eventually create a different user interface for some group of those users. But it doesn't go up you know, exactly uh, proportionally there. And, and often, the more users you have, you end up with more processes. Simple little systems with a small number of users typically have relatively few and simple processes, fewer exception processes, all that kind of stuff. But this is kind of the, the benign side of, of this little curve or the, uh, the virtuous part. And this is where, what we were saying earlier, this is what you want, actually. This is, you want to scale these up. You will actually make money, typically, if you have more users, more content, more data. The other side of this is where your money goes. As you have more schema, every estimating thing I've ever seen says that schema, increasing the complexity of your schema directly increases the, the size and complexity of your code. It indirectly, you know, at some point, schemas get complex enough that people break them off into separate applications, you know, because it's just gotten too big and we can't launch that project, it's too much. Once you launch more applications, you end up with more interfaces, and the interfaces cost you money. The schema itself very often contributes to the size and complexity of the interfaces. Every time you add more schema, you end up with more user interfaces because every, you know, every time you create another table, you got another user interface for it, and that tends to lead to more processes. So this, is, this side of the thing is where you're spending all your money. You know, all this is, for the most part, money spent is where you're making money. What we want to focus on oops, there it is, is, is this guy's key role in kind of blowing this out. If we can, if we can even save a tiny percent here, we can save a lot over here. That's what we're, that's what we're going to talk about with the elegance. So, and I think everybody, I mean, I think you're at this conference and you're in this session because you've noticed that there appears to be an explosion of schema out there. Everybody has tons of it. And is that just a fact of life? Is that something we have to accept? Or is that something we can do something about? In order to figure out whether we can do something about it, we have to ask ourselves, well, where did it come from? You know, I just described something very generally. It said, you know, more schema, at least more code, et cetera, et cetera. But how come we... Why do we have so much schema? Um, there's three or four reasons that I've observed. One of them is the way we design things. Um, some of it's our tools, some of it's just bad habits. I'm gonna talk about a little of each of these. <clears throat> Probably one of the main contributors, I think the slide after this is, is maybe a bigger contributor, is when we go to design things, every time we encounter what we think is a new thing, and you know, we talk to our users, oh, we got this different kind of thing here. Oh, I know what, that, that, we need a new table because it has different attributes. And that's just the way we think. You know, if this, this thing is more different than this other thing. New table, new attributes, off we go. And we very subtly introduced a lot more complexity. We started that whole cascade of expense there. 
because, you know, you get the new table and it has more different columns. Every column you stick on the table is now a new contributor to the problem you have. And then the mere fact that you created a table means you've got typically at least four user interfaces, you know, a create, an update, a read, and a delete for every, every table, almost. And then that will in turn cause you to have more processes. And it's just a... Um, this is, this is one that we fight all the time. Our business sponsors think, have decided that they don't want to reinvent the wheel, go out and acquire a package. And if you could black box, black box a package, yeah, maybe you could reduce complexity. But nobody's ever black boxed a package. For the first, in the first place, they have a user interface. In fact, they don't have a user interface, they have thousands. You know, you buy a package and it has anywhere from dozens to thousands of, and, and you, right away, you, that runs the cost of your training up, your procedures, and all those multiplier effects we talked about. But the more insidious thing is, um, the package you bought has its own logical, physical, and conceptual model baked right into it. It's got all its own terminology, and sooner or later you're going to have to deal with it. And the bigger and more complex it is, the more it's going to cost you to deal with it. I mean, it just is. It doesn't matter whether you created the scheme or somebody else did. If you got to deal with it and it interacts with everything else you're doing, it's, you know, the meter's running. It's running the cost up. And the other thing that's interesting about packaged software is it's typically far more complex than anything you could or would make up on your own. You know, lots of people run their businesses and they have something equivalent to an ERP system, but nobody would make up something as complex as SAP. I mean, nobody has that much imagination. It takes decades to do that. <clears throat> um, here's, one, here's one of the other things that, that comes in that's it's sort of amusing. I think we were at um, an agency for the state of Washington that does all the financials for the state of Washington. And, and one of the nice things was they had a metadata repository so they could suck stuff out of all the systems they had. So they had a really nice uh, um, inventory of everything they had in all their systems, which is unusual. And, and they had tokenized you know, all, the, all the variables so they tore them apart into the little word phrases that you, that you have. And I, I just went combing through this thing and found, and unfortunately this slide is, is my mental recreation. I couldn't find the original slide, but I, um, I found, looking through all their systems, that they had something like 24 different ways to say sort of. Of course, they don't. Accountants don't say sort of. They say things like, "Well, this is the you know general ledger budgeted year end amount, or the estimated amount, or the allotted, or the predicted, or the set aside." We just went on and on. It was kind of comical, and they looked at that and they sort of nodded. And I said, "But the point is, um, I I bet two things. One was that there are not twenty four nuanced differences in, in sort of, nor do these things all mean exactly the same thing." They don't. Most people would look at, it. and it took several hours. But it turns out there's about there's about four conceptually different things in there. You know, and you can imagine. And I'm not going to get into what the four are, but but what's important is if you implement twenty when there's really four, that's not five times more complex. That's way more than five times more complex because all the interactions of every time you have to get some data from one system to another and figure out whether estimated is close enough to predict it or approximate it or set aside or whatever it was, um, the harder things get. So this is another, and, and we, unfortunately, we tend to do this. And, and what, we, what we're doing is, is trying to make up, well, there's two things we're doing. One, we like to make up new words when we make up new tables. I don't know why that is. I've observed it myself and I've observed it in others. And we like to contextualize it so it sounds good on that table that you're working with. So a lot of these just come from, from one of those two uh, tendencies. But the net result is you got a lot of extra complexity there that you don't want or need. So what I'm going to suggest is if we, can, if we can get a hold of the complexity of our schema and reduce that, like I was saying with the IRS example, it'll have uh, a very positive knock-on effect. 
So here's our methodology for doing it. So a lot of that was just setting the stage. Here's the problem. I think you probably bought into that. Um, I'm going to describe how to go about that. This is mostly inspired by what we've been doing with semantics, but you don't have to un really understand OWL or semantics or anything in order to do this. I think it just requires a, a mental shift to start thinking about the problem differently and start thinking, I'd rather reduce complexity than continue to contribute to it. And that, that's probably almost all you need to do. Um, <clears throat> most of the places we've been have upwards of 100,000, occasionally a million attributes in their collective, you know, schemosphere, if you will, or schemasome, whatever you want to call it. Um, but really, most places have a thousand or two thousand essential concepts. If you can find those essential concepts and and relate everything back to them, you you know you've really done something. I mean, if you've reduced the top one by one percent, you've really done something. But if you reduce it a hundredfold or a thousandfold, then you've really really done something, John. Uh, both, actually. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm, I'm, I just add, because the deeper you get into semantics, um, we define concepts from their properties very often, and we just mix them together and add them up. Um, yeah, so we're, we're shooting for a, a reduction of 100-fold here, but we'd be happy to get 10%. Um, and what happens if you can get like the IRS example? There's probably nobody that understands all 30,000 concepts in the IRS, be my guess. But if you can get it down to 3,000, you know, there are a handful of people that can understand all of it and smaller numbers of people that can understand major sub portions of it. You can, you know, if you get down to that size, it's a, it's governable now, you know, just the, the sheer scale and that, you know, it has the, the effect. So you're, you know, I just made some wild claims. You can reduce things a hundredfold, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you a couple of examples with with numerical information um, from four clients we worked with, and we weren't, like I said at the time, this isn't what this wasn't what we were trying to do. We were trying to build an enterprise ontology and do various different things, whatever it happened to be on that project. But this is what happened. So many folks know Sally May. They do student loans, pretty big organization. When we'd done this modeling thing, that they had 51,000, if you added up the attributes and the entities in their existing loan origination, loan servicing, and guarantee systems, you know, there's five or six major systems. We did this enterprise ontology and ended up with 1,200 classes and 353 properties. One of the things that, if you're paying attention here, you're going to find that looks odd, and you're going to, this oddness will repeat itself. Um, and I'm going to talk about where that comes from. How can you have fewer properties and classes? What is that? How do, can that even be? We'll get to that. Bear with me just for a second. But this one, um, subsequently, they went out and outsourced um, one of the, a new line of student loans, and and but then realized that that had a different database, that had a different user interface, that had different all. Different, you know, everything was different again. And then they went, oh, hey, let's use the ontology to integrate this with our other systems. And it was, or let's use the ontology to provide a single interface based on the ontology to the new system and the systems they had. And actually worked out pretty well. We, we didn't have to extend, we did extend it some, you know, as you get down to the details, you realize, oh yeah, here's a couple things we didn't think of and stuff. But it didn't blow back out to 51,000. You know, it, it blew up 10% or something. So, you know, that's the, and that's pretty significant. That's a, that's a lot of extra point to point N squared kind of interface you don't have to do. Uh, we work with Procter and Gamble in the research department. The research department is 10,000 people, um, huge, you know, and they're in hundreds of different disciplines. In this case, the issue was they have uh, people retiring and, you know, knowledge workers aren't, you know, people are inventing Swiffers and, Duracell batteries and all of whatever they, they invent, and they were worried they were going to lose the collective wisdom they had. Um, and it was kind of a knowledge management thing. We wanted to build an ontology, but the problem in this case was, and, and they didn't have one they were starting with. It, you know, 
researchers just do research, you know, and they fill out their timesheets. That's about it. Um, and every research area literally has its own language. You know, the, the battery guys talk about anodes and cathodes and chemical reactions and all that kind of stuff. But they believed that they should be able to do queries across all the research groups and find, um, in fact, they, they think that a lot of their key successes are where they found odd combinations between you know, the disparate groups. But the battery guys call deposition sputtering, you know, putting small particles on flat surfaces or something. And everybody had a different name for what essentially was the same thing. But anyway, there we, when we did the ontology, 400 classes, 192 properties to represent the shared concepts of research and development. And as we blew it out, in this case, we blew it out for batteries and toothbrushes. Um, it added lots, it added a lot of classes, but only nine properties. So now we've got all the batteries and all the toothbrushes as an extension. You know, most of, in fact, all these extra classes, or almost all of them, were defined in terms of classes that already existed. So if you knew these and could do a query on these, you would find these. That's the whole idea there for the reuse. Um, and then they, they extended it to a couple more product lines. And what they said was, yeah, they hardly had to, they hardly had to extend this at all. They added, you know, every time they went to a you know, baby care, they had to add obviously some more classes, but all kind of derived from this core. And we had LexisNexis. Um, you know, there, here the scope is content man. You know, they have a lots and lots, hundreds of millions, billions of documents of content. Um, and we work with them. This one's a little bit different, you know, as um, Terry Mulholland said, very few people have enterprise models. Um, that's been our observation as well. Lexus does and did. So we uh, extracted a lot of what they had in their logical models, put it in the shared model, and it's still fairly elegant. What's, what's interesting is, I think because we didn't do it by hand, we weren't concentrating on reusing the properties as much. But still, that's a pretty elegant model for something the size of LexisNexis, and that's what they're going forward with now. And just recently, we did a healthcare company, and healthcare is, is actually pretty complex. Um, but in this, and this is the delivery of healthcare, so it's you know hospitals and clinics and extent, uh, you know, life care and home care and got all kinds of stuff, and, and an insurance company, um, and that ended up with that size of, of uh, numbers of properties and stuff. Right now we're doing, uh, actually with Bernadette and, and uh, Three Round Stones, we're doing a proof of concept of taking this ontology and showing how we can extend those concepts into the linked open data cloud, bring uh, external data in, map it up with internal data, et cetera. And, and again, one of the things that we think makes that tractable is getting your core down to a manageable size. So. Um, you know, here's, you know, if, if, if we learned anything, we, it's that this is possible. What we want, now want to talk about a little bit is how do you do this? How do you, how do you get down to something simpler? Um, semantic technology, or, or really just thinking semantically, gets you a lot of the way there. Um, it's sort of like object-oriented. People later said, you know, you don't have to have an object-oriented language to do object-oriented programming. And that's literally true. If you already know how to do object-oriented, yes, you could do it in assembler. But most people, given an assembler and the idea of object-oriented, aren't going to snap those together. It just doesn't happen that way. So, so some of the technology actually helps you think differently. But the real point is to think differently. Um, and a couple of things, you know, obviously I can't go into a whole deal about semantics right now, but I think there's three or four things that are sort of interesting. I'll give you a couple of case examples to, to kind of get the, the wheels going there. Um, semantic, the semantic approach is more about attempting to model the real world. And at first, we think that the real world is way more complex than the simplification that we have in our models. But the truth is almost just the opposite. The, the real world becomes the final arbitrar of everything you do. And I could model this little thing I'm holding in my hand a hundred times, and it probably has been modeled a hundred times in a hundred different systems. But it's just this thing. 
You know, in the real world, it's actually kind of simple. So, you know, if I put an RFID tag on it, I'd pretty much be done. I'd just say, well, it's a thing and it has an ID. If I wanted to say some more about it, you know, I can, I can add that on. But um, my observation is the fact that we have so many identifiers for the same thing and so many ways of categorizing the same thing, we've made our what should have been a simplified world more complex than the one we're trying to model. So that's one observation. This is the one that I kind of hinted at with the properties. Um, in semantic technology, properties are first class objects. They exist on their own, which is a which is a novel idea if you've been doing either relational or object oriented most of your life, because in relational or object oriented, you create the class of the table first, and then you put attributes on it. And because of that, you end up with more attributes than than concepts or classes or tables. But in semantics, properties exist on their own. You invent them first, and you reuse them later. And if you invent them well, they're incredibly reusable. You can, you know, the has part could be a relationship. And really, the fact that this thing has a part and my body has a part semantically is the same relationship. And we should recognize this the same relationship and reuse it wherever we can. So that's where a lot of that dramatic reduction comes from. You just recognize, oh yeah, I've, I've, this thing means that the thing on the left describes the thing on the right. I should just use the same term again. And then you get a, yet another add-on benefit when you start thinking about reusing properties. Properties now have inheritance. You know, we're used to thinking of uh, classes having inheritance, but in semantics, if, if we say We've got a property called has, has ancestor. And that's the relationship of two people that are genetically related. And I later say, oh, I've got this specialization of this property called having a parent. But I then say that having a parent implies that you have an ancestor. It implies specifically that that person is one of your ancestors, but not vice versa. And it's just because somebody's your ancestor doesn't mean they're your parent. But because someone's your parent, it does mean they're one of your ancestors. Um, you know, you get this extra uh, reuse benefit, where you know you don't you don't have to say this every time you use it. But probably one of the one of the more interesting things about semantic technology or thinking semantically is, and and we we've, we've just fallen into this sort of subconsciously. In a traditional system, every time we make a new table or a new class, we imply that it's different than everything else we've done. We don't say that. And sometimes with object-oriented, we actually make it a subclass of something that existed. But for the, you know, for the most part, that's more of an exception than the rule. Whereas with semantics, when you're constructing a formal definition of what something means, the system is figuring out constantly behind the scenes which things are similar to something I've already got. And it's, it's telling you that. It's helping you design, et cetera, et cetera. So you end up with um, a lot of concepts similar to other ones, and you can use that similarity as you're constructing queries, all that kind of stuff like that. So it cuts down a lot of you know, just X's, joins, and all that kind of stuff. And then one of the, um, one of the last sort of benefits of, of thinking semantically is you don't have to deal with structure issues. We're really trying to figure out what something means, not how am I going to put it in a database. So if you find yourself, you know, drawing something like drawing a junction record or something like that, it's because you're thinking of how am I going to store this. But this isn't a semantic concern. How you, you know how the foreign keys and all that stuff link up, and whether it's even whether it's many to many or any of that kind of stuff, because you're really just trying to say, what is the concept in the real world? How am I going to describe it? How do I, how do I describe membership in this class? And how do I describe what it means to have properties for this thing? And then later, in another step, you derive this stuff from the semantic description. So just by putting that out of your head makes things a lot less complicated. In the first place, you drop a whole bunch of these things that don't exist in the real world. It makes it simpler just, just for starters. So how do you go about 
doing that, assuming that was a good idea and that was kind of fun. Um, we use, you don't have to, but this seems to be, this seems to work really well, so I would suggest it. Um, an upper ontology. So before you go in, before we go into a company, we have uh, something that's called GIST. It's freely available. It's, it's a, a Creative Commons license, so you can just take it and do whatever you want with it, as long as you attribute it. Um, so it's one of those kind of licenses. It's on our website. Um, and it has about 100, about 200, actually, if you take the classes and probably 200 of the most common uh, classes and properties that we f have found in business systems. Those are kind of the bedrock things that you just see over and over and over again. So we start with that and then specialize from there. And what we find is somewhere around 98% of the things that we find in a healthcare company or a, or a legal research company or a research and development company or a student loan company are derived from things we already knew about. So, you know, that's kind of reinforced. And then the other 2%, it's fine to create a few new classes. Like at Procter & Gamble, interestingly, we came, this is probably no surprise, you came across the concept of a brand and scratched your head for a long time and could, it didn't fit any of our preconceived notions. And in fact, a brand is a very complex thing. And of course, nobody knows that probably better than Procter & Gamble and they've been doing this for 100 years and they, so we just said that would be a separate class. We don't exactly know what a brand really is. It's, you know, it's a promise, and it's a this, and it's a that, and it has logos. And you know, we just set aside, here's your brands. So it doesn't have to, not everything has to be derived from the, from the top. Um, in this upper ontology, we have, there's, a, there's like about eight really key high-level concepts. Um, some of them barely read this little red. These are... This is from the work we did with the healthcare folks, and we drew this picture where the size of the bubble was proportionate to the number of classes that were underneath it, just to get an idea. And we would have thought, you know, in healthcare, there's a lot of physical stuff going on. They've got scalpels and blood and all kinds of things. But it turned out there weren't that many that you really need to distinguish at, at the semantic level. They had a bunch more. They were more interested in kinds of places even more social beings or people or organizations or you know, insurance companies or anybody who can get involved in contracts. Um, this is a kind of a catch-all for a lot of things you just have to have to make a system work, you know, collections and dates and units of measure and all that sort of stuff. Um, but real big down here, all the things that happen to you in the healthcare world, you know, whether you have an appendectomy or go to the doctor or have a follow-up or even get a bill, the, the content, the body of knowledge of, of medicine itself, yeah. What did you say was in that red doctor? Um, physical things. And then, and then motivation is why are you doing the things you're doing, which is, includes things like obligations, agreements, contracts, stuff like that. There's, there's several things in that category. But you know, it turns out most things fit into this scheme. One level down for Sentara, about 200 classes. You know, you can still print this on the wall. You can't read it on the PowerPoint. You can print it on the wall, find most of the key concepts, and then there's another level below that. So here's a, a methodology. Uh, here's kind of step-by-step step how to go about this, and this was just sort of reverse engineered from these last four projects. We asked ourselves what we did. That says illicit structure. That's a typo. It should be illicit semantics, but um, a lot of the way we do this is find people, you know, subject matter experts and business analysts, but also some IT folks who understand what's either in or should be in these systems. Um, you know, and, and elicit information from them, but pretty rapidly after that, start aligning it with the upper ontology. So you, because as you'll see in the slide in a minute, you want to challenge um, your thinking as this stuff comes at you and say, what is that thing they just described, or where does it really belong? And in the act of doing that, you get a lot more clear about what kind of thing it really is. I have that as an example, and that has a, you know, has a tendency to feed back on itself, and we do more interviews and get more data, start aligning it some more. But then you want to start creating what we call exemplars, little examples of parts of their model expressed semantically so that you could see, am I 
creating valid inferences? Are these, if somebody looked at these, would they make sense? Does the does the patient actually have a visit? Does the visit have a physician, you know, an attending physician, all that kind of stuff? Um, and then at some point, you just you just discover, oh, I got a lot of very similar sort of things here, and you can start saying, well, maybe that maybe there's a, a missing concept in here that would resolve that. And then you know more. Then we start looking at existing systems, whether it's a interfaces to existing systems or the databases or profiling or whatever because what we want to start exploring now is completeness you know we've done some of this exercise have we really covered most of the important concepts in the organization and, and most of the important concepts are somewhere in somebody's system you can't well you could but uh, this is kind of a sampling thing you want to go through and see am I you know roughly covering everything because there'd be 50,000 attributes and millions of rows and you know, there's a lot of work to really do this all the way out. Typically we want to come up with some way to visualize it. That last one had the crop circles but you know, there's all kinds of ways to visualize these things but you eventually need to visualize it because we're going to socialize it. In other words, we have to show it to people. We have to get people to understand what does it mean, why should you buy in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so conceptually, if you started with an upper ontology, you build out an enterprise ontology, and then eventually um, you specialize this either line of business, like we said with Procter and Gamble, or this could be applications. This application takes all the concepts from the core, specializes them, puts some structure to them, rearranges it. Very often, you know, adds in distinctions that they're interested in locally that the rest of the enterprise isn't. Well, I, was, I was sitting in John's presentation yesterday and it occurred to me I should take one of these, put it in between them, and say, you know, there's, there's these, these taxonomies are um, typically, uh, they're not sort of first class, you know, major structural elements. They are ways we make fine distinction between similar things. Very often they sh should be uh, owned and managed by people that understand the domain. And if they're shared, they should be kind of in between these guys, you know, to where they can share them, like reference data. And very often, some of these live outside your organization. You know, if you're in healthcare, this is, you know, CPT codes or IC, you know, disease codes and procedure codes and all those kind of things that you don't necessarily want in your ontology. You want to recognize your ontology knows about diseases, but it doesn't need to know about all 100,000 diseases they've come up with and they keep changing every year. Those are kind of taxonomy things that we'll, we'll specialize things in later. So just a few tips. I think I'm good for five more minutes here. Um, and I've got a slide for each of these. You know, I'm, I'm going to put this one up because we made this mistake. So, I'm, you know, every once in a while you aren't rigorous enough. You come across a concept like in healthcare, they have the concept of a facility, you know, a healthcare facility. And we thought, oh, that sounds pretty good. We just made a class and we started specializing and building other things around it. And it was quite late in the day that we realized we should have asked ourselves a question earlier on, which was, what is a facility anyway? And there's, and there's four logical things that it could be, at least relative. It could be literally a building, which is a physical place. I mean, my previous thing would be in that red dot of, of a physical thing. It could, sometimes people refer to a group of buildings, a campus, if you will, as the facility. Sometimes they mean the, the actual region. If you drew a space on the earth, you say, that's, that's a facility. That one's a little rare, but um, one of the guys who was doing this, I think, had that concept from his days at Boeing. As, and as it turned out, most of the usage, they're referring to the organization, not the physical plant, although I find that weird. And so, um, unfortunately, we left this one confused. And so much later, some people could think it was the organization. Some people could think it was the building, et cetera. And that is actually a problem. That's one of those kinds of things that if you're more rigorous up front, every time you hear something new, well, what is that? You, know, you won't fall into that trap. Um, address is another one. Every, everybody's system has an address. Everybody thinks they know what an address means. Um, the real problem with... And oh, it was great to hear in the in the presentation yesterday that 23% of all addresses are wrong. 
<laughs> I had a feeling that was true. Um, because you put an address in an address field, and it's one of three things. It's either um, a, a tiny piece of content that tells you where a building is, and if you're a UPS, that's what you want to know. And what's different about this, you can get geocodes, and you can put a lat long and put a pin in a map. This is just a routing code for the post office. And a lot of times, it's one and the same. But it isn't always one and the same. And it's when it isn't that it screws you up. That you know, post office boxes and APO addresses and various other things uh, are postal addresses that are not building addresses. And when, when you get to this point, you realize, if I have an address, if, I, if I've done data profiling and absolutely know that it's both, I just I can make two of them and say, here is the building address, and, he, and it's also their postal address. So in the cases where it isn't, yeah. Um, as I've heard you explain this in our data modeling environment, this sounds very similar to me, the concepts for super types, subtypes, and abstract. Mm -hmm. It is. Is this the same or different? Um, <laughs> same or different. It's, it's very similar. <laughs> um, and uh, in fact, in in semantics, you you do end up with supertypes and subtypes. Although it's um, there's two things that are a little bit different about it. One is it ends up being much more of a lattice than you typically would design doing it yourself. You know, when we do supertypes and subtypes, we typically, although not always, have single inheritance trees. You don't have to, but mo you know, my observation is most designers do that. It's because of how they think. Um, and the other thing is, um, in semantic technology, we use the definition of the thing to help us place the thing in the hierarchy. In other words, when you make a formal definition, I didn't get into that much here, time doesn't permit, but um, a system will figure out that, for instance, a patient is a person. Just by, the, you know, when you construct a formal definition of what a healthcare patient is, you know, and we'll run the reasoner, and it does a lot of that subtyping. Now, some of it's obvious, but it, every once in a while it comes up with some interesting subtyping. You go, oh, yeah, I guess that is one of those. But uh, beyond that, it is pretty similar. And, and, and my earlier admonition still holds. If with subtyping, supertyping, and everything, you could reduce the complexity of your schema, you would reduce the cost of your systems. I, mean, I absolutely believe that. And sometimes an address is what we call a geo region. In other words, um, you know, we did some work for a workers' comp company, and some of their addresses are neither deliverable by the post office nor would UPS take a package there. You know, if you got hurt at exit 243, that was the address, and that's only a geo region. It's not either of these kind of things. So that is it. I've got a few white papers about this, which well. Yeah, and time for questions. Yeah. Quick question from the, the property reuse. Mm -hmm. Because just last week, a colleague and I got into a thing where uh, social security number, mm -hmm. um, and you know we do it as a verb, you know, has social security. Mm -hmm. number. I like right. the verb. Yep. And I had given direction to the team that we were not going to constrain the domain on that so that it would be reused. Right. And my colleague is saying, you know, it really bugged him. Because it's a person that has a social security number, not the card or not an information exchange between the things. And so he was saying we needed to create more properties so that we could be more right. precise in our language. But that introduces the complexity that you're saying. Right. So what what yeah. would you Right. I don't know if everyone systems? heard that. The, the question was they got into a thing about reusing properties and and if you reuse them at one level, they appear to be less specific, I guess. But it does introduce the complexity problem. Um, and how we typically do that, in fact, the example was with social security numbers. We have a, a, a property called has identifier. If, if you wanted to, you could say, you know, has social security number is a specialization of that. And, the, and the, there's a, a benefit already, which is uh, anytime you ask, Anything for its identifier, if it happens to have a social security number, you'll pick up the social security number. That is a benefit. But you actually don't need this extra property. And, and the reason is when you go to define a 
uh, this would be the, the definition of a, of a legal person in the U.S. or something like that, you would say that they, uh, they have an identifier that is in the range of, we're going to invent a class over here, that is owned by the Social Security Administration. So they are the domain. They're the, they're the person who assigns these identifiers. It is a subclass of, this is a subclass of a type of ID. So your actual number, your Social Security number is going to be over here. And we say, this is qualified by that, and it's part of the definition of this class. And mo occasionally, you do need to be more specific and add an extra property. That's why there's 400 instead of 200. <coughs> but most of the time, I don't, I don't think creating the extra property buys you anything. It takes stuff away. So it's, it's, it's recasting some of the stuff as classes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting the connection between the oncologies we're discussing and the actual schemas. You right. said that the oncologies, of course, they're not concerned with the details of how you store the data, right. where the schemas must be. Yeah. And so it seems as though even if you got to a point where you had an elegant minimum set of concepts, you might still have thousands of different schemas that correspond to different needs for storage optimization and different query patterns. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in what way does having yeah, that's a great one. I don't know if everybody heard that, but if if you do end up having to have uh, lots of schema to handle your storage needs, your application specific, all that kind of stuff, don't you still have the same level of complexity? And the, the well, the relationship is what you want the relationship to be is is model driven. So from the ontology to these schemas at best, or at least mapped, so that as you create dozens or hundreds of applications, if they're all derived from the same elegant concepts, even if you rename them, in some cases we've, we've created tools where as it's derived from A to B, it gets renamed. But if you keep that mapped, then a lot later when it's time to go integrate two systems, you're not back to, you know, having to do a lot of investigative research to figure out, do these concepts really mean the same thing? No, they do mean the same thing because they derived from the same place. So it takes a lot of complexity out at that level. It doesn't, obviously, it doesn't get rid of all the complexity. It's just trying to reduce it. So I think, uh, I'll take one more question and then uh, a round of applause, huh? But <laughs> hold that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank. I do have some white papers up here, and uh, thank you.